All right, let's begin. Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Reva Param Brahma Asmai Sri Gurave Namaha Chinmayam Pyapyat Sarvam Trilokyam Sacharacharam Tatpadam darshitam yena asmai sri gurave namaha Pameva matha chapita Pameva Pameva bandhus cha sakha Pameva Pameva medya dravinam Vameva Sarvam Namadeva Deva Vameva Sarvam Namadeva Deva Jai Guru Yadevi Sarva Bhuteshu Marupena Sansitaha Namastasyai, 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 namo namaha. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, Shakti Rupena Sansitaha. Namastasyai, 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 namo namaha. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, Buddhi Rupena Sansita Namastasyai 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 Namo Namaha Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Lakshmi Rupena Sansita Namastasyai 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 Namo Namaha So we're continuing in the fourth chapter, and we've had uh, Hemaleka relating the story of the king who drank too much, who was married to the woman who cheated on him with uh, a bad boy hot servant, and how in his drunkenness, he ended up doing the mufti pufti with the maid, thinking it was his wife. So what it illustrates is there's just no accountant for taste. And the location of the object of desire is in our imagination. I'm seeing a little tiny box. Can you guys still all hear me? Yes. OK. The iPad's doing weird things. So the location is in my imagination. I create, largely through the force of my past, what I decide is desirable. I decide that I am bereft of happiness, that it's out there. And then I go running toward it. And then when I get it, desire and object of desire become one. And I think the happiness is in the person, place, thing, or situation. What it really is, is for a moment, 
the mind has come home. In the beginning art of meditation class, I like to use the image. It's like we have a large piece of butcher paper and I draw the picture of a carrot on it. And then I find a stick that's just a little bit longer than my arm. I put a little thing on the end of it and I hook it up to my head so the carrot is just out of reach. And then I start running to try to catch the carrot. And if I'm lucky, the wind blows and I can grab the picture of the carrot that I drew, that I decided is separate from me. And I think I'm so smart. Ooh, I have a carrot. That's all the mind does. So, the fool goes after the world when desire and object of desire become one. He goes, oh, that's a great widget. I need more widgets. The yogi desire arises in the heart. Ah, oh, desire, force of the past maturing. That's all it is. Any widgets around? No, nope. drop it. There's a widget. I think I'll dance with the widget today. When desire and object desire become one. Oh, that stopped my mind. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Listen very carefully. In the end, Desire and enjoyment are not impediments to realization. It is a false distinction to talk about spiritual bliss as opposed to worldly pleasures. In the beginning, we set up that distinction. But actually, the world is empty. It is shunyata. I attribute to the objects of the senses, joy giving or misery producing qualities. And I use them to induce the momentary mind state of freedom from vancha, desiring, kama, craving, spriha, long, Krishna, thirsting. In the end, what we're looking for out there in the world, we're looking with, is the mind abiding in the self. And this is why meditation is so important because without it, the only happiness we get is what we call a mediated experience of the bliss of myself. As much as I may theoretically know it's me, if the only joy I get is through the medium, media of the objects, I will still have an addictive relationship, an attachment. But if I begin a meditative practice, I will begin to get moments of great peace. Great serenity, great contentment, not caused by any object. It will be an immediate, a non-mediated experience. What we call Atmaramana, reveling in myself. 
All right, what verse are we on and who's chanting this evening? I can chant. Thank you. We are in verse 87, chapter four. All right. Ya evam tibim batste vitanvanti ratim naraha vita krimibhya kutastesham bhavedantara miraya. Tell me how there can be difference between worms in excretia and those men who thus make their pleasure in an extremely disgusting object. So who has more fun? The worms burrowing in a pile of poop or humans doing the mufti pufti? <laughs> so to each creature, it has what it desires and it labels this as pleasurable. Next one. Raja putro tanu riyam riyahi nitaram tava vibhavaya vivekena dhatu namcha prithak sthitam. Prince, this body is indeed extremely dear to you. Contemplate with discrimination the different states of the essential ingredients of the body. So here, by means of discrimination, vivekena, vicharena, by means of discrimination, this is our chief means of being able to break this, this incredibly intense attachment that we have to the body. Nature has set it up that way. And uh, Shankara does this in great detail in Viveka Chudamani. It's the dissection meditation, I call it. Skin, dermis and epidermis, blood, bone, fat, filled with feces and urine. That's the body. Just don't bathe it or wipe it or wash it for a couple of weeks and tell me how desirable a body is. It's really only tolerable with an enormous amount of care. Oh, that girl, she has such beautiful breasts, They're so big. Well, what if you just cut them open and, you know, and fondle the, the lymph glands? Ew. Oh, that dude, he's got a six pack. But you can flay them open and play with the intestines. Is that, is that sexy for you? No. It's really our idea. It's all it ever is. Next one. Evam anya tropa yojye. Madhura Lamba Dishadasrase Parinama Swabhavatum Sukshmadrishtya Vibhavaya. Thus observe carefully with your subtle intellect the innate disposition for transformation or decline in the six tastes of, of sweetness, sourness, and the like, which are to be used or enjoyed elsewhere. So here she's saying now, not just the body itself, but now go through the various senses. And she starts here with taste. Uh, 
what one person finds as tasty, another person doesn't. It's all very individual. Um, Anyway, you get the idea. Going on. Next. Akshitasya pisarvasya vidbhava parinamake sarvatha natra sandreha sandeha savairiva vibhavitaha. Even for everything that is eaten, there is the state of excretia after digestion. There is no doubt at all in this matter. This is quite understood by everybody. Yes, isn't that interesting? Oh, that wonderful meal I had last night is this morning's poop. Oh, so-and-so spent hours cooking. 12 hours later, it's this morning's poop, where it all ends up. Next one. Vadevam sansthite loke kim priyam syat kim apriyam ityukto hema chudotha vairasya vishaye vidan Shrutva Purvam Vakya Jalam Vistimato Vismito Bhavadanjasa. Say, when it is thus established in the world, what is pleasing and what, sorry, say, when it is thus established in the world, what is pleasing and what is not. Then Hemachura, thus addressed, understanding the insipidity of objects of sense and having heard the extraordinary speech of Hemaleka was justly astonished. So she is now showing him why attachment to objects of the senses leads only to sorrow. So remember the frame of this section. He goes to her and they, he just all over her and he's having such great pleasure doing the, the, the mufti pufti with her. And she seems abstracted. And he says, I'm not having any fun because you're not having any fun. Remember the frame. And she says, well, the reason I'm not having any fun, well, I, I'm actually always wondering where happiness is. And he says, that's silly. Getting what you want makes you happy. Not getting what you want makes you unhappy. She says, is that really so? And she begins to introduce him to this idea of where is happiness. The inherent impermanence of all things. That what one person desires, another person doesn't. That not all people gain happiness from the same objects. Even when I get what I want, there's the law of diminishing return. You get C's candies for Christmas. One chocolate's wonderful, but if you eat the whole box, does not continue to deliver the results. So the underlying question is, what is it that has pleasure as its dharma? Dharma here meaning the nature of a thing, the essence of a thing, without which it would not be what it is. Nothing in the world inherently has pleasure or happiness as its inherent essence. The 
But when the mind comes home, oh, I'm happy. That's why these three great words we have in the scriptures, Satchidananda. In the beginning, I say existence, consciousness, and you're always experiencing those. Ananda, bliss absolute. Well, I'm not happy all the time. That can't be my self nature. You don't really understand it. So in the beginning, we say no sorrow reaches there. Does that mean there's just emptiness? Why do they call it Ananda? Why don't they say Satchit Shunya? Because it is the source of the mind's happiness. It is the fountainhead of all bliss. When the mind comes home, it becomes blissful. How does it come home? When it can let go of what we call the vikshepa shakti, the projecting, the extroverting and that ceases the suffering goes away the easiest way to prove that is everybody universally enjoys deep sleep no object causes the pleasure of deep sleep what causes the pleasure of deep sleep the absence of the extroverting mind Problem is, you're still just in deep ignorance. You only know about it in memory. Oh, I slept so soundly last night, I can't remember a thing. Any thoughts on this, what I call the pleasure principle? It's foundational. It's very interesting. I talk with Buddhists on occasion. I say, what's your take? on Buddha's Four Noble Truths. This was the first turning of the wheel of Dharma in Buddhism. Oh, I can't remember what they are. And if you don't understand the Four Noble Truths, the rest of it, you get all caught up in ancillary stuff. Truth number one, the truth of dukkha, suffering. Life the way most people live, it sucks. Suffering. Noble truth number two, the cause of suffering is craving. Kama, Krishna. Noble truth number three, freedom from craving is freedom from suffering. We prove it in two places, when you satisfy a desire and when you go to sleep. Noble truth number four, it is possible to be permanently free from suffering. How? Fateful path, sadhana. Engage in a way of life that undoes the whole view of the world. Getting what I want will make me happy. Any thoughts on this before we go on? Uh, Jim, I had one question. Please. Uh, the way you've spoken about the pleasure principle, which it uh, demonstrates that when the object of uh, desire is met, there's momentarily a cessation of mind. And that's what you mean by the pleasure principle. Similarly, can there be a, a sorrow principle which demonstrates something similar? A very good question. Sorrow is the mind under the throes of longing. That's what sorrow is. When, okay. when we are in the state 
of wanting something we don't have or the flip side, that's called raga, the flip side, dvesha, aversion. I want to get rid of something I don't like or what I call the neurotic form. I have what I want, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose it so I can't really enjoy it. Yoga says, can you find any other kind of sorrow? Now, we have physical pain, and we'll put that on the shelf. But that's not why people, you know, hang themselves or slash their wrists or jump off bridges. That's not why people, you know, become alcoholics or drug addicts. Okay. That's Does that make sense? Yes, very much. Thank you. Okay. Very good question. Very good question. So technically what happens is first we have a riti or ignorance or a varana shakti, which is a covering power. We do not understand what the F is going on. As the result of that, the mind has vikshepa shakti. You can look at that in two ways. We project a phenomenal world and then we imbue it with the qualities of myself. So, suck. That object over there is, and it's separate from me. Shit. Oh, that person over there makes me so happy. They are a conscious sentient being separate from me. Ananda, the happiness is over there. So what we have, again, the technical term is called anyonya adyas, mutual superimposition. So I superimpose upon myself the qualities of the not self. I think I'm my body. I think I'm my feelings. I think I'm my thoughts. And then I superimpose upon the world my own self nature. Separated. It's out there. Sentient beings out there, and most importantly, the Ananda is out there. And that projecting power is called Vikshepa Shakti, from Kshipati, which means to throw or like hurl a spear. It's a little technical, but does that make it a little clearer? Yes, very much. Excellent question. Okay. Going on, next verse. Vicharya bhuya tat sarvam yaduktam he malekhaya bhogeshu jada nirvedaha param vairagya mapnavan. Reflecting again on everything that was uttered by Himalekha and with disgust produced in enjoyments, he obtained the greatest indifference to worldly pleasures. So, the fruit of mature discrimination, viveka, is vairagya, mature dispassion or detachment. If you think you will achieve detachment out of a moral idea, I'm going to be a goody goody and be a renunciate. because of the things your parents have taught you or your society has taught you, I guarantee you it won't work. It's called suppression. And if you do it long enough, you will end up bending the personality, perverting the psyche, and ultimately making it unfit for yoga. So what we want to do is what Swamiji used to call sublimate our desires. Let me give you an example. So college kids, it's Friday night. There you are in the dorm and you have a 
big paper due Monday. Really love this class. You want to work hard on this paper. You want to really do well on it. And all your friends come to your dorm room and they say, we're going out for pizza and beer. You want to come with us? And you go, oh, I do. I want to go hang out with my friends. But then a greater desire comes. You say, no, but I really want to spend time on this paper. Sorry, guys, you'll have to go without me. So you sublimate the lesser desire into a greater one. That's how we leave the world, through insight. So once we begin to examine what happens when we're attached to the world, it is that insight that allows us to begin to give up our detachments. Will your mind go through a grieving process? Yeah. One of the examples I like to use, one of our, our members of our Sangha, many of you know her, Vishwa. Vishwa has celiac disease, which is very rare in Indians. It's quite unusual in Indians. But um, she is uh, highly allergic to gluten. She had all sorts of digestive issues for years. Nobody could figure out what it is. Finally, they tested her. Well, she wasn't able to give up donuts and scones and things like that without grieving in the beginning. But once she saw that, if I eat the donut, I'm going to get a bellyache. She saw the cause and effect relationship. Then in time, she was able to give it up. So you and I must watch our minds. And when we find ourselves wanting, wanting, wanting. When I was doing my sadhana, my nickname for my mind was Mudha, fool. There you are, Jim, wanting, wanting, wanting. And it's so repetitive. I'm all upset. I want something some way. Da, 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 da. Tell me it's the first time you felt this. No. Aren't you tired of it? Yeah. Give it up. Let go, let go, let go. Talking with a gal over the weekend. She had an expectation that her boyfriend was going to spend time with her. He never said he would. But he had other plans. She was crushed. First thing the ego does, he has a problem. He's not paying enough attention to me. He's being abusive. No. He had other plans. If I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the attachment, with the expectation, with the identification. If I'm suffering, I have thwarted desire. That's what it is. And when it hurts bad enough, I'll develop the desire to let go. We've all had this experience. 
you're in the car, you're on your way to work or a meeting and traffic is heavy and you're running late. And there you are, gripping the wheel, you know, trying to push the traffic with your heart. Get going, get going, get going. And upset and anxious and after a while you go, I'm just going to get there when I get there. Whew. Haven't made the traffic go any faster, but we let go. We stopped craving. That's what the yogi wants to do. Don't fool ourselves. If I'm disturbed, if I'm upset, I'm the one who's stuck wanting, 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 wanting. Buddha. And when you do get what you want, desire and object of desire become one. It's myself. It's not the object. So, Hemaleka has instructed Hemachuda in this principle. And he has examined the world and the way his mind has related to it and has begun to develop detachment. Now, the language of the scriptures can be a bit deceptive here. It says here that he develops with disgust for worldly pleasures. We want to make sure that we don't get caught up into hating the world or flesh hating and stuff like that. I like the language Gita says, Sama Drishta. You want to find a place of neutrality, of equality of vision. So you are neither yearning after things, but neither are you, you know, having an aversion for things. To me, that's the best posture. Any thoughts on this? All of yoga can be reduced to this simple formula. Let go and keep your heart up all through the day, all the time. Just keep letting go and keep your heart open. Next verse. Atha kramena prishtvatvam priyam gyatva chatatpadam kevalam chitimat mastha Tripura Atma Rupi, Tripura Atma Rupinim, Buddha Va Bhavat Vimukta Atma, Swatma Bhuta Kilakshinena. Then, having questioned his beloved gradually, having understood that state of the truth, and having known Tripura, who is pure intelligence or consciousness, abiding, abiding in his own self or inner organ of perception, and whose natural state is the self or the supreme spirit, he became a liberated soul beholding everything as his own self. Yes. So it's not just letting go of everything. It is so beautifully articulated in Gita. In the second chapter, it's verse 55. In verse 54, Arjuna says, uh, a man of wisdom, how does he walk, how does he talk, how does he sit, etc. Krishna then sets forth the first idea of the Stitta Pragya Purusha section. When a man, when a person casts off all the desires of the mind, O Bhagavan, and is satisfied in the self, by the self. Then, 
not one is said to be a person of steady wisdom. It's the essence of yoga right there. So it's not just letting go of the world. If that's what you do and you have no samadhi, you can get into a very nihilistic place. The world tastes like ashes, but you have no bliss because you haven't developed that trick of being able to revel in your own self nature. Next verse. Jeevan Mukta Samabhavad Tatastasyanu Jopihi Mani Chudo Vivad Bharatum Mukta Chudo Piputrataha he became liberated while living. Thereafter, his brother Manichuda also knew the reality from his brother Himachuda and Muktachuda, his father, also from his son. So again, we're going back to the original idea. What is the root cause of liberation? Sadhu Sangha, association with the wise. So Himachuda achieved liberation because of his association with Hemaleka. And then he was went on and we don't know the conversation, but his brother probably said, dude, you're different. You're really happy. You're so peaceful. Nothing seems to bother you. You're chill. How'd you do this? What's going on? Here's an important point. Who we are speaks louder than anything we say. You do not need to beat people over the head with non-dualism. Wait till they ask. This is not an evangelical teaching. When you have what they want, people will ask. Then share generously. And then they even enlighten their father. Mukhtachuri, you're never too old. Next one. Mukta Chuda Priya Chapi Snushaya Gyana Masadat Mantrini Chapi Paurascha Babhuva Vugyana Shalinaha. The wife of Mukta Chuda also attained knowledge through her daughter in law. The ministers and the citizens also became endowed with knowledge. So this knowledge starts to spread. The queen is enlightened by her daughter in law and then the rest of the court, and finally all the people, the citizens of the capital. Going on. Na tatra nagare kasched vedvan samajayata asid brahma pura prakhyam shanta sanstriti vasanam. In that city, no one was born who was not wise. It was resembling the city of Brahma, the creator, with worldly desires or impressions extinguished. So this idea of a golden age in this city, people grew up, everything around them brought them to this knowledge. Very interesting. Back when I was a very young man, I was, uh, I read Karl Marx. I was, uh, pieces of me still am a Marxist. But one of Marx's, Marx's ideas was that it was economic structures which oppressed people or might liberate them. And that's proven historically not to be completely true. 
because if unethical or short-sighted people wield structures, they can become oppressive. Antithetically, it can be in a very arcane social economic structure. But if the right people, the enlightened sage, wields it, it may not be oppressive. So we have Stalin ruling a communist country. I'm not quite sure how liberated that was. And we had the Dalai Lamas ruling Tibet, which was a feudal society. And sure, there was inequities there. But by and large, it was a theocracy. The spiritual culture was imbued throughout. So it's not just the external forms. It's also the hearts and the minds of the people. This was Swamiji's great, great task after independence. He said, India is now free. Now we must free Indians. And his target audience was the college educated young men and women who would become the future leaders of India. That was his target audience. So that they would move into positions of leadership, but with knowledge in their hearts. How successful he was, who can say? But you can carry that into all dimensions of life, the corporate structure, academia. Next verse. Vishala nagaram tacha jagatatya yuttam babhau yatra kira sharikascha pancha Jarastha Pathanti Vai. That city of Vishala became the most excellent in the world where parrots and sarika birds staying in their cages indeed recite as follows. So even the birds in the cages recited things of knowledge. Next verse. Chitta, chitti Rupam Swamatmanam Bhajadvam Cheta Yar Chetya Varjitam Nasti Chetyam Chite Randyad Darpana Prati Bimbavad. Worship your own self, which is of the nature of pure consciousness, without objects to be known. There is no object to be known which is other than pure consciousness, like the reflection in a mirror in a mirror. Note the ultimate reality is pure consciousness, and the visible universe is like a reflected image in the mirror of pure consciousness and has no existence apart from the mirror. Yes. So I love this phraseology, worship yourself. Again, we have this idea of Atmaramana, reveling in our self nature. Some of you at some point may have studied the Narada Bhakti Sutra, which is a great scripture on devotion. Many of us, we think of devotion, we're devoted to an idea of God. But in the end, the greatest of all devotion, the greatest prema, is being devoted to this this reveling in the bliss of the sun. And what is this world? It too is the self. The names and forms are consciousness alone. We'll go more deeply into that idea as we get further into the text. 
Next verse. Chitishritam Chitiraham Chitti Sarvam Characharam Yata Sarvam Chitti Manu Bhati Satu Swatantrataha The knowledge, so the knowable object is pure consciousness and the I or the subject is pure consciousness and the entire world of movable and immovable objects is pure consciousness since everything shines after consciousness but it shines by itself. So this idea of everything being consciousness is easy to understand if we go to the dream state. I like to say you are the god of your dream. So in the dream state, the precondition to the dream state is falling asleep. That is the state of avritti, ignorance. It's the non-apprehension of myself as the waker. Then there's vikshepa shakti, the subsequent projection of the dream world. In the dream world, I have a dream body and a dream ego identified with it and a locus of perception in that dream body. I peep out of that dream body's senses at the dream world. But in that dream world, all the people, places, things, nature, cars, everything, in fact, is nothing but my mind appearing as all that stuff dream body, the dream ego, the dream thoughts, the dream feelings, the dream world, they're not separate from my mind. All of this comes about in the same way. Now listen very carefully. You as an ego are not dreaming the universe. Ishwara is the dreamer of the universe. But what it is, is consciousness. Chandogya thunders, Sarvam Kalvidam Dhamma. All this phenomenal world of the Technical usage is sarvam idam, all this means the jagat, the phenomenal world, is verily Brahman. Nothing but God here. All is maya, all is bliss. Next one. Kada chit evam ki ranam, Shrutva vyakyam mahodayam, Brahmana vama devadhya, Nama chakshu parasyatu. Once vama deva and other brahmanas, thus having heard the highly elevated words of the parrots, Call the city by a certain name. So visiting sages coming to it, see it as the city of the wise. They change its name because everyone in the city was enlightened. They were all people of wisdom. Next verse. I think I missed a verse. I'm sorry. All right, back up. Uh, Atishitim jana sarva, bhasini sarva sanshrayam, bhajadham branti mutsrajya, chiti matra sudrishtayaha. Therefore, O men, worship your consciousness, the illuminator of all and the dwelling place of everything, giving up delusion and perceiving pure consciousness alone. Yes, yeah, so this is again the parrots saying all this. So the parrots become gurus. They're also enlightened. Forgive up your delusion. 
Give up your firmly rooted belief in the delusion of the world. And then we've already covered the verse where visiting sages were amazed at this city. Going on. Yatotra Vidyam Piryan Jopi Hastuma Midampuram Prasiddhi Prasiddha Vidyanagaram Iti Nam Nam Prasiddhat Prasiddhyatu Since even birds speak about knowledge here, therefore let this city be made known as the famous city of knowledge. So the sages call it the city of knowledge when even the birds speak of it. Going on, next verse. Tadhyapi Jate Naiva Namna Tanna Nagaram Stitam Rama Tasmatu Sansango Mulam Sarva Shubodaye. Consequently, that city is existing by that very name even today. Rama, therefore, association with the wise is the basis for the, for the rise of all happiness. So now we're going back to our frame story. The Tatriya says uh, um, to, to Ram, uh, association with the wise is the root cause of liberation. When we have the great punya to come across someone who's shrotriyam, well-versed in the means of knowledge, who themselves is a full knower of the Supreme, who's retired to the Supreme, As calm as a fire that has burnt up its fuel, not afflicted by desire. It's an ocean of compassion, I assume. An intimate friend of those who have come to them. Uh, and things happen. Next one. Sanghena Hemale Kaya Sarve Vidya Vidobhavan Tasma Sangha Param Mulam Ramam Janihi Shreyasaha. All became conversant with spiritual knowledge by the association of Hemaleka. Rama, therefore, no association with the wise is the chief basis of the highest good. Absolutely, absolutely. Summing it up. Next one. And that's the last verse of this. That's chapter. the last verse of that chapter. Okay, I think we'll quit here. We've got a couple more minutes before the end, and we'll start chapter five, where we get this very funny allegory in chapter five. So we have time for questions. Any thoughts about anything we've covered so far? Uh, Jim, I had a comment. Uh, Please. I think it was uh, maybe a few verses uh, ago, uh, once uh, the entire story has been narrated by Hemalekha, uh, and Hemachuda says, you know, the verse says that having heard her, he at once uh, understood the highest truth and then henceforth abided in his own true nature. It makes it sound very simple. Uh, right? But I mean, there's a the whole part of sadhana is sort of uh, cut out from the story then, right? It, it can't just be that he heard it and he got it. Well, we don't know. Right. There is no process in self-realization. Mm -hmm. The only process is attaining a sattvic mind. The only process is becoming a fit student. Mm. 
Enlightenment is sudden. You either see it or you don't. If you can't see it, it means there's still vasana covering the line. And we, this strikes at many of the illusions that we have about what happens. Shankara, as many of the, the, the commentators do, frequently use the image of the snake and the rope. Have you heard this one before? Yes. So the issue is I do not apprehend this, the rope. So my mind projects a snake. It could have projected a water line. It could have projected a stick. But my mind projects a snake. So what do I need to do to get rid of the snake? I investigate. And I see, I go through my fear. Oh, oh wait, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no snake there. It's a rope. I've been meditating now for 20 years. I'm getting closer to the self. That's like saying the head of my snake has turned into a rope. I'm advancing. <laughs> no. Or the one is well, they say you can continue to live in the world and, and uh, enjoy and still have enlightenment. That's the person who keeps smooching the snake. That won't work either. Now, the worst one. Oh, I've given up everything. I never have any fun anywhere. I don't enjoy anything in the world. And I'm a breatharian, and all that I eat is radish bread. That's like the person who takes a baseball bat. If you beat that snake enough, will it turn into a rope? Mm. But if I'm too frightened and my mind is too agitated, to investigate what looks like a snake, I will never see the rope. So all of sadhana is about purifying the subtle equipment so that it becomes fit for investigation. How much time does that take? Can't tell you. We take a great saint like Ramana Maharshi. He had a, a school chum pass away. All of a sudden he was obsessed with death. 16 years of age, he comes home, he lies down on the floor and he does subject of discrimination. Who dies, what dies? Achieved enlightenment in about a half an hour. His sadhana took half an hour. <laughs> Other people may do practices for decades and uh, nothing happens. Mm. I tell you, self-realization is not difficult. Krishna says the same thing, easy to perform. Yet it's very rare. It's very rare, not because it's difficult. It's very rare because nobody wants it. Mm. Because we're still under the state of ignorance. Yeah, but I want drug, sex, and rock and roll. My happiness is out there. It's lack of real discrimination. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. So again, I'm referring back to Viveka Chudamani, one of my favorite books in the whole tradition. And Shankara says, success in spiritual endeavors is entirely due to the degree of the qualifications of a fit student. Mm. 
So you don't become a fit student and then go through all these other practices. It's all about becoming a fit student. And then it happens very quickly. Learn to discriminate. First qualification, that firm conviction in the intellect that Brahman alone is real and the phenomenal world is unreal. A famous saying of Shankara, Brahma Satyam Jagannitya. Vairagya, this fashion. That desire, we don't do it overnight, to give up all attachment to enjoyments gain through the senses and all identification with any form of self from the body up to and including Brahma, the creator, meaning I'm a powerful person. Hmm. That commitment, that desire to let go of all these ideas of self. Third qualification, shamadi guna, qualities of shama, etc. There's six of them. Shama, Dhamma, Upariti, sense withdrawal. Titiksha, forbearance. Uh, Shraddha, faith. Samadhana, real peace of mind when you're in steady contemplation of the goal. The last is Mumukshutwa, the burning desire for liberation. So that's what we spend our time working on. That's the preparatory stuff. What does that do? It sharpens the subtle intellect. So the mm -hmm. wonder sword of knowledge can cut asunder the uh, Hridaya Granti, the knots of the heart. But you either see it or you don't. Now, you can have what I call the yo-yo state. There are moments when you really are clear and you know, Aham Brahmasmi, I am that partless Brahman. But then because of Vasana, the mind gets covered again and I forget. And I get identified all over again. And then, you know, I wake up. Oh, I forgot. Yes, I am that Brahman. And I get identified again. So it's again, Annihilation of the Vasanas until we have steady wisdom. Steady wisdom. Shankara, he in, in, in one of the verses is 267. Says, even after realization of the truth, meaning I've had these glimpses, there exists a strong impression that one is the doer and the enjoyer. Karta and Bhokta which is the cause for rebirth. Here rebirth doesn't mean I reincarnate as a buffalo. It means I get identified. It needs to be conscientiously rooted out how through steady identification with the self. The annihilation of the vasanas here and now is considered liberation by the world. That's a process, but it's simply a process of purifying the equipment. You see it? You don't. Does that make it a little clearer? That was very useful, Jim. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's just one small verse, but that one verse in the way that you have opened it up is, is, was very useful for me. Thank you. Well, thank Shankara, because that's basically <laughs> what I gave you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good question. Very good question.
So it was a literary device. So, mm. you know, uh, uh, our, our author uh, kind of summed up that stuff. The point he wanted to make in this chapter is about association with the wise and he was emphasizing the nature of understanding the impermanence of the phenomenal world so that we can begin to let go of our attachment to it. That's the key point. These final verses will return to those in death throughout the book. All right, any other questions?